So I recently started a Discord, um, uh, you know, specific channel because you have different topics in there and it's on production fails. And one of my loyal supporters, Paul Xenopath from LA, big ups to you, my G. Um, we did a podcast a while ago on conquering addiction because Paul's really been down to the bottom and come back. And for that reason, he's got more knowledge than anyone on how to overcome habits and stuff. Definitely go and chat to him. Anyway, uh, yeah, what was I saying? Oh yeah, he asked me to do a video about uh, my production fails. I've probably made similar videos to, to this in the past, but I thought I'd, do, I'd record a little video uh, as it's nice and sunny this morning with my morning coffee. Uh, I'm still drinking coffee, but only uh, one or two uh, instead of nine, so that's good. Um, but yeah, can't start the day properly without one, to be honest, it's not the same. Uh, anyway, uh, yeah, so I'm sort of just riffing off the top of my head, just I haven't really made a, a plan or structure for the topics that I'm going to cover with production fails, but so um, things that I sort of used to think or do that I realised that weren't really helping at all. So uh, one thing would be, or, or myths as well. So the first kind of myth would be, uh, let's say, uh, talking about mastering. Um, I, I guess I used to think that mastering was like this, this really sort of secretive hidden thing that only uh, only a few people could do and it was it was all super top secret and they would do something to your track that would just you wouldn't really be able to understand or believe it ha you know what what's happened or it's taken it to this extra level that you could never get to yourself um yeah i used to really believe that <laughs> uh, i thought oh it's okay like when the song's like nearly done when they master it it's gonna be like finally professional and perfect and while that is true uh, it's not something that you can't get to yourself because I realized as I went on uh, producers would just finish their own tracks and then um, they would already be as good as mastered ones and I'm like okay well they're just obviously you know they're really good but the thing is is that you can uh, you can do it all you can get a, you can get a track to be like 100% highest sound quality possible within your project without it being mastered and if you give it to a mastering engineer when it's already like absolutely maxed out and like perfectly loud and dynamic just within your mix, they're gonna struggle to, to find anything to do. <laughs> I've had this with a couple of uh, clients, like sometimes, you know, it all depends on the level of like kind of mix down and track that they've sent. You know, if it's like not quite absolutely slamming or perfect, then of course I can make it better. But if it's like really been pushed to the max and it's absolutely sounding wicked already, sometimes I'm just like, Eh, like it's not much more I can do. You've already kind of maxed it out, mate. So yeah, to think that this whole um, mastering like super top secret advice and information um, is is like a a thing that you know it's like a fantasy almost, you know, because it's not because it is just maximizing the audio file as much as it will go. Sometimes it's already been maxed out, and yeah, I do I do teach mastering as well, uh, but again, in in that sense. Yeah, I'm just teaching you how to get the best out of the file that you've got if there's sort of any any room left you know but it's not like I'm gonna tell you there's this one plugin that you have to use that's just absolutely just gonna change your life you know <laughs> or this one piece of hardware that's just gonna change your life all right so that's one thing other thing uh, EQing I guess uh, I used to think that I used to have to heavily uh, EQ stuff uh, get these really aggressive spikes take that down do like really complex eq patterns so it's sort of like a visual art piece what i've done with my eq uh the the more i've gone on i'm just like eq just less and less because you realize that um eqing is is a form of taking away the quality of the sound so it's when you every time you eq something you're saying this sound isn't good enough so i've got to try and fix it uh, so when you try and work backwards and get that sound to be uh, absolutely right and perfect and the right sound for that part of the song to begin with, uh, then you know you, you have to EQ less. And when you do EQ, you know, because even though, you know, even though ideally you don't want to have to do any work or EQ anything and everything is already perfect, uh, obviously we still have to mix stuff together to get it to fit. Uh, but so when we do that and when we do EQ stuff, 
Uh, it's really about doing it in the most subtle and smooth way as possible. That's why I like really, really soft um, and like wide kind of curves. Uh, yeah, nothing too sharp because again, like the, the sharper you're going, the more the EQ is gonna have to compensate to recreate the new uh, sonic image that it's do that it's creating and you're giving it more m more hard work always when with the more extreme uh, settings that you apply so uh, it's better to stack EQs like I kind of always mention um, softly slowly but surely you know sculpting the sound smoothly one stage at a time so that's one thing I I, um, I used to fail at because I used to really heavily EQ the hell out of my sounds uh, to try and get them to fit you know how I thought they needed to look and um, they end up damaging the whole quality of the sound without sort of realizing it uh, yeah so another thing um, is super over processing to get that professional sound in like your um, in your groups or on like your base your main base or your base channel let's say that this is something I've done before I had this track called consumed which I released uh, on this uh, check label ages ago um, but yeah basically I spent like months on this track on, on um, the processing chain of this bass because I was in this mindset where I've got to get the best most modern current neurofunk bass sound I can possibly get and the only way to get there would be to really refine it and and filter it and run it through so many different plugins at once that, that it's going to be so unique and so different and i was going around in circles with this bass for months <laughs> and the reason i was going around in circles was because everything i was applying to it and adding to it was making it worse <laughs> so the more the more i added to it to try and make it unique um really just destroyed it and by the end of it it was so sort of tinny and horrible um <laughs> I don't know how I fixed it in the end. I, I found a way to get it to sort of be good enough still, but the amount of time I spent on it was just ridiculous. Just trying to chase this phantom of like the most amazing new bass sound. But really, uh, when, uh, as I've gone on, you know, just becoming really simplified in what constitutes a bass, you know, sine wave, triangle wave, bit of saw wave, bit of white noise, how is it sort of moving grasping the real 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 fundamental aspects of of synthesis and um something that i go over in my production sessions as well we can do synthesis lessons uh i tend, tend to just sort of um i might have to structure like a proper synthesis um like class or course because i don't really with those ones i kind of just go a bit freestyle like i do mostly on my production lessons um the mastering course is kind of planned out, but with the synthesis, uh, I, th I think I could do like a more structured synthesis course, but it's just, yeah, it's just finding the time to plan that all. Um, so I sort of typically teach that sort of uh, freestyle at the moment. Um, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, just getting a better grasping of what constitutes the bass sound to begin with, getting the fundamentals right. And then uh, you can still have, have your fun and do all this crazy over-processing in the right areas, like in the layers, like you make a distortion layer to fit in just in the high end, in the background, you know, with a bit of stereo panning and stuff and go really ham, go ham on that one, really go nuts on that layer, you know, there you can go crazy, add a hundred plugins and bounce it out. But the main part of your sound like the main bass you know realistically if it's coming away from that sine wave <laughs> too much it's not going to be as powerful so you, you you have got rules in a sense of you know which sound waves are used in which parts of the frequency spectrum so over processing your whole bass like so much and especially if you're trying to like make new layers and, and multi-band it three times and then blend it all back together often it's going to do more harm than good and yeah so you don't have to go to all these extremes to create a good base when you just really uh, focus on the fundamentals of what a baseline is and what it's made from and don't, don't sort of try to go away from that because it is sort of there for a reason you know those shapes they are there for a reason <laughs> so anyway uh, yeah that's one thing with sort of over processing 
any other production fails. Yeah, I, I guess also outside of uh, producing specifically, choosing a good name. <laughs> uh, I used to think that, I used to go around in circles choosing names for my, my um, myself, like I had, uh, uh, there was a Battle Force was one, there was a Mantis was one. Um, <laughs> I've had so many names as I was starting out, I couldn't settle on one. And the reason why was because I always thought that, um, you know, my, uh, the name is gonna make me, you know, having a wicked name is gonna, oh, people, that's such a cool name. And really it's the complete other way around. Like you make the name for yourself. Like I'm Artifact and I, I've made that, I came up with that name years ago and I, I probably would have chosen something different, but it's the fact that I stuck with it and it's the fact that I just, you know, kept releasing under that, kept doing stuff under that, that the name, that I built that name, basically. The name doesn't define me, it's just, you know, I, I define me and that's the name that I chose, that I stuck with. So just pick a name and stick with it. Something that's like, I liked my one because it was easier to Google because I, I used to be with the I and, and I changed the I to a one. So you can sort of find it a bit easier. So something that you can, you know, realistically be able to search for is good. But apart from that, it's better just to sort of stick with it and realize that you're making the name, the name is not making you. Um, man make the money, money don't make the man, right? Uh, yeah, so that's one thing. Uh, I'm trying to think if there's any other sort of, there's, well, there's probably hundreds of other production fails. Um, compressor, compress, compression, um, getting obsessed with like, trying to understand a compressor. It's still difficult for some people to grasp what a compressor does. But it's super simple, really, if you think about it, you know, you're taking the high parts of a, of a recording and bringing them down so everything's level. And so why, and then, you know, if, if that's what you're doing, why, when and why do you need to use that? You need to figure that out, you know? But the, the whole myth of, you know, um, oh, you need to compress your, your drums, you need to compress it to get that punchy snare, like you won't get a punchy snare unless you compress it. Like it's all absolute drivel. It's, you know, you've got to understand the basic principle of what, what a compressor does and then, and then choose when and where to apply it in your, in your, in your mix down. It's useful, definitely, to have, but you've got to know why you're using it. So, yeah, production fail. Getting lost in these narratives that have been perpetuated for years in music production uh, internet space, getting lost in them, without doing the work on understanding the fundamentals myself and myself choosing when to apply certain techniques. Uh, so yeah, don't fall into like specific narratives of music production or, or the way that people say that you should do things. Uh, because really, if you learn the complete, you know, proper basic concepts well yourself, then you're 100% gonna be able to make those decisions completely yourself in your mix across the whole board on this channel on that channel on that group you want to and it's not super super difficult to understand you, even the stock plugins in your door are there for a reason they all have a purpose there's only so many certain things you can manipulate audio with and there's a reason why you do why you manipulate audio with everything and there's a reason why your your door has these certain plugins is because that is the limitations of how you can manipulate a sound you know if there was like some super like new plugin that was doing something so revolutionary and new you know that would it's not really going to do something that's not already possible and already been incorporated into the music software that you own so you need to understand the basics of what everything does and then decide how and when to use it and that's the part that's like, you know, the grind, you know, it's like doing your daily 100 push-ups or whatever. It's the part that no one wants to do because you want to uh, take your protein shake and play on this new fitness machine. But realistically, if you just, if you just like sucked it up and, and you know, get down on the floor and did those push-ups every day consistently, you'd get much better results. It's harder, it's more boring but that's the truth and that's the reality of, of music production. It can be hard and boring and it's those hard and boring things that you've got to get right uh, and they're the most important and all the glitz and glamour and sparkly new toys 
only take you away from that. So fight that battle of boredom and learn the basics. Learn about uh, learn about sound selection and placing things in the right space and, and what sounds would fit in the right frequency area. Learn about orchestral arrangements. Why, why does an orchestra work to get well together? It's because, you know, wh why would a composer like Hans Zimmer have a double bass down here, then some violins here, and then a piccolo flute up here? It's because all of those instruments have a specific frequency range and they work well together because they are not occupying the same frequency range. So even in orchestral arrangements, you can, you can learn about that, apply that and break that down into mix down and realize that there are set, set parameters for each instrument. And the reason why they're chosen is because they fill out a stereo image, you know, or they fill out the frequency spectrum uh, so well together because of the way that they don't overlap with each other. And when they do, uh, when things do overlap, they're typically done uh, separately from each other in the composition. So, you know, a different main mid-range uh, lead or vocal or guitar will tend to take the dominance at one part of the composition. And then the sound that's directly conflicting with it will take dominance in the mid-range in a, another part of the composition, be it via a call and response section happening or just two different kind of sections. But, you know, things will be placed in such a way that they don't overlap and cause confusion in the frequency spectrum. And you can learn all about that with orchest orchestral arrangements, and then you can apply that same knowledge to electronic music production on choosing uh, which sounds fit where. So that's, yeah, that's another really, really helpful tip, I think. So, yeah, hope you guys enjoyed watching this uh, little video today. Again, if you want to support me, you can head over to Patreon. There are a number of benefits just to join from even one euro a month. It really helps a lot, helps to fund everything I do and pay for all my Zoom subscriptions and website subscriptions and all this absolute nonsense I have to pay for all the time. Uh, yeah, so really, even if it's just one euro, really super, super helps out a lot. Goes towards something to keep the whole show running. Uh, yeah, and also if you want to join my Discord, uh, we have a bit of a tighter, smaller crew because uh, it's a little bit more expensive, but we want really people to be really committed and a real kind of family in that. So that's the reason why it costs a bit more nowadays. But yeah, you can also join that. There's a few spots there as well. And yeah, thanks a lot for watching. Peace out. Have a wicked day.